an honor to call you Father. Our Father. Our Father. The one that adopted us. And loved us. Even though we didn't deserve that. You continue to love us even when we're unlovely because that's just how good a father you are. And you looked out on this congregation and you saw that we would have no hope. And so you sent your only begotten son, Jesus, to die for us. Only a holy God could do that. And so we worship you, our holy God. And ask that today while we're in your presence that you would just stir us. You've called us to be holy and so cleanse us and purify us. And when we leave these doors, may all those around us be able to see that we're holy like you are. So that we can point them to you. Oh Jesus, we love you. Just ask that we're more like you today than we've ever been before. And I pray this in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Join me in uh, Matthew's gospel. We're going to uh, start a new series this morning. Uh, We finished up uh, 2 Samuel a couple weeks ago with nothing is beyond his grace and Missed all of you this past Sunday. Listen to Josh and watch service uh, afterward and uh, online. It was great to hear him preach and teach the Word of God. And um, thank you, God, for faithful men. Uh, I'm surrounded by some the best, and I'm so thankful to God for uh, for who we have in our church family to be able to teach the Word of God, to preach, to minister, to serve, to to do all that God would have us to, to accomplish in the mission work. We are starting, you see up on the, the screen, life in his kingdom. And uh, we're going to look at um, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. For all of you uh, Bible peoples, that is called the, there's one of you that knows it, come on. The Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount this this morning uh, in an introductory way and look at it for a few weeks, you say, well, that's an interesting passage that you grab. Well, we'll get into it a little bit and you'll find out the, why the Lord led us to that place and, and we'll highlight some things. We'll look at a, a little bit of an outline of the, of the message series, uh, Life in His Kingdom. We, by the way, have been looking at David's kingdom and ultimately, of course, as uh, David understood that that kingdom that he was able to rule over uh, really had no success factor unless it was God's kingdom. And uh, we're about to look into Matthew's gospel. And uh, of the four gospels, uh, you might say, without Matthew's gospel, we wouldn't have that transition, and we wouldn't. But we know that in Matthew's gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is presented in presents himself, but is presented as the Messiah, the King of Israel, that he is coming, and the one that they were looking for, yet they did not respond to in terms of receiving him. But the the text, the Sermon on the Mount, has a lot of really, really tremendous uh, practical stuff for us, and also will teach through it doctrinally, understand theologically, understand historically in the setting Say, why in the world would we look at a passage of Scripture that was written to the Jews and not look at something that was written directly to the church? Well, you'll be able to see what's going on here. We, if we were only to preach and teach out of the Scriptures that were directed to the audience of the church, then we wouldn't have been in 2 Samuel for the last six months, seven months, because that's the Old Testament. But we see that God really comes through by the Holy Spirit's words that say all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof and correction of instruction and righteousness. I've heard that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable and it will be profitable for us. Um, Before I go further, I need to uh, kind of, uh, not kind of, to deliver a a very important message and uh, 
and exciting. And uh, at the same time, um, kind of a reality of the way God does work and how God is at work in his kingdom work. Uh, Brian Calloway is, uh, most all of you know, is uh, in Africa. He's in Zambia. He's been there for a few weeks. He spent his time in the quarantine that they required. And then uh, he has been at the, at the mission work. And uh, he has set up a, a meeting, a uh, very important meeting. And uh, it was with the executive board of GCMS. That is the governing body of the mission work there uh, that was set up many, many years ago when uh, Bobby was there, Bobby and Becky and their family. And uh, uh, that's the uh, overseeing, recognized uh, organization in Zambia for the work that they do. And of course, I am here in this country is recognized as the USA's side of supporting the work in sub-Sahara Africa, supporting the, the works there, the indigenous works, the, the church planting works, and tied together to all the work there. So I am International African Missions and uh, GCMS work in uh, partnership and work in cohesion to accomplish the work. Uh, that being said, this meeting is a meeting that has to happen uh, every year, and this is a special meeting because Brian had gone over, and, and uh, of course, Brian has been working through a lot of things, and him and his wife and family praying through what God would have them to do. Well, we were waiting on that, and, and we need to do that and allow him as the leader uh, there and recognized uh, president of that board to uh, deliver uh, what is the next steps in God's direction over there and how things are going. And yesterday, Saturday in, uh, in Kafula Futa, uh, Brian let them know, and uh, it was received very well. As he said, it was a spirit-led time as God had placed in his heart when he showed up there over four years, around four years ago. Uh, God had placed in Brian's heart, his heart, for the mission work, and God gave uh, him uh, and Tammy and, of course, uh, their son a, a heart for the ministry. But as time has gone on over the years, things do change. And so in this time of change, uh, the message he delivered was that uh, um, he will be stepping down and he will be returning to the United States and no longer being the person that oversees that work. In light of that, uh, God has done a tremendous work in and Bobby knows a little bit about this man. His name is Pastor Pule. And Pastor Pule is the one that is going to be uh, the overseer and the director of the work there, a national man, something that 30 years ago uh, was prayed over. That news came to me in email last evening, and uh, it, is, uh, it behooves me to share with you, church, so that you know that uh, uh, God's mission and God's work and and God's people there are going to continue to thrive and that the leadership now of that work will be under uh, a national man by the name of Pastor Pule. Of course, now that uh, we need to allow Brian to have the time to come back. Brian is coming back in the middle of September. And uh, Brian will be coming back in September. He has other, other things that he's planning through and he's going to share, with, uh, share them during the conference because he is going to be our special speaker or be our speaker that's special uh, at our Acts 1A conference. So that is very exciting for us. I also would like to be able to take the time now to uh, let you know that they've wanted me to scream from the, from the uh, mountaintops for a number of weeks. But again, we've waited for the Lord to speak through Brian and, and talk to uh, these very, very precious and special people in Zambia because... They're giving news now that is a little bit different than what they're used to in terms of a missionary, American missionary being there. Um, and they've gone through all, already, of course, a number of change with uh, the passing of John Sarah, the passing of Lorna, and of course, a lot of transitions over the last short time, the last two or three years. But there's a, a, a young lady that went to Africa a number of years ago. And uh, came back and uh, then went again. And the last time she went, she did not come back because she got married. And uh, she married a young man by the name of Alex Chippy. And um, they are headed back into this country along with Brian in the middle of September 
to be part of our Acts 1-8 conference. And so that's pretty exciting. You ought to really just rejoice in the Lord. That um, So be praying for this. They've got to get over into the plains and through everything. And Brian's uh, adventure over was an interesting adventure, but nothing different. Uh, if you want to hear some adventures, just ask Bobby and Becky of the many adventures over 30 years of travel. And, and so uh, they will be... Uh, Alex and Crystal have two little girls, and uh, Alex is going to be part of our Acts 1-8 conference. He's going to be preaching uh, as well, and uh, so all of that's coming together, and we're looking forward to, uh, to a different, uh, some changes. And so Brian will be off the field, and we'll be back. Uh, there's other things, again, that he's going to share with you, church, and I'll allow him to do that, but... Uh, he has wanted me to be able to stand and, and let you know as the sending church, uh, as a sending pastor, that uh, as we laid hands on him to go out four years ago, um, it's hard to believe it's been four years, Tammy and uh, Titus and, and Brian have been back since, last, uh, since Labor Day time last year. And uh, through everything, God has just uh, worked this through. And there's a lot of, a lot of things here to pray over. The work there needs the continued prayers and support of I am here and, and uh, looking forward to what God shows us. There's a lot here and there's a lot for us to be able to see and, and uh, understand in terms of uh, God's uh, purpose and God's plan for everything. And uh, again, uh, it's very, very serious, very, very uh, important and, and this change it also too is uh, very exciting in a lot of ways is uh, Brian and, and Tammy are going to be, uh, and their family are going to be off the field now. Um, he's going to be traveling still over there, uh, but beyond that and how that works out, he's just looking to the Lord and, and the, next, the next part and step. So Matthew chapter number five, I, I uh, hope that you found the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it's included in uh, chapter number five, uh, verses number 1 through chapter number 7, verse 29. The title of our message this morning, it's my message, but it's actually his sermon. This is his sermon. This is Jesus' sermon, and it should be that way all the time. And there is, as I mentioned in a little bit, but uh, in giving you some background, we're going to just introduce this series this morning. And, and you say, well, okay, Pastor, why are we going down this road in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, um, this passage, again, in this gospel, is mostly directed to the Jew. And so there's divided opinions over how it's uh, laid out, the design of this gospel that, of course, Jesus Christ, as I said earlier, um, he is um, spoken of and speaks of himself as the king, the Messiah, the one that they are looking for. He's also looked at here as the one who's also, teacher, and you see as much teaching as in any of the Gospels highlighted here, his discourses. And so the scope and the, the application, interpretation of this uh, three chapters can be, um, it can be looked at as being a little bit controversial in, in that how does it apply. Again, dispensationally, the Bible and how this book, uh, Gospel of Matthew is laid out. You say, well, if it's to the Jews, why do we even bother? Why, why, why would we even, I mean, it's just for them. But God, again, shows us, as I said earlier, that all Scripture is given and is profitable. So it's given by God for us. The eight Beatitudes that start out chapter number five, and that lesson that we'll be looking at those and those lessons there, they can be looked at as golden rule principles. You, you see the golden rule that could come out. But keep in mind, golden rule in the world that's just their way. The way of saying, well, hey, I could just live a good life, but an unredeemed, unregenerated, lost person cannot fulfill any of this. They may look to this, and there's religions that say, well, blessed is this and blessed is that. If I just follow through on all these, then I will be definitely going to and be part of God's kingdom. I mean, that's what it says right there. But please understand and this will help you. 
Look at verse number 20 and understand how important as we look at introducing this passage of Scripture, what the Lord is saying here for us. Verse number 20 of chapter number 5, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness, except your righteousness, he's being personal here, he's got the multitudes gathered, he's got his disciples sitting around him, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The term kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is mentioned 32 times in Matthew's gospel. But we don't deal with the kingdom of heaven beyond that, understanding that God also tells us about, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom that the Lord has always wanted to establish. He's always wanted to establish this for his people. Well, that's something that's going to come now. It's on delay. It's coming in the millennial reign of Christ. And that's when the kingdom of heaven in its physical completion will be established with the Lord Jesus Christ reigning. That's when God reigns over his people. You say, well, then what's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is a Holy Spirit of God change in you that comes at salvation. To understand what the kingdom of God is, you must really think about some simple statements that are said in the Gospels beyond Matthew's Gospel. Again, Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We're just going to speak on that one verse, because that's our highlight and our theme verse for the study here in a little bit. But understand what Jesus also said. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the what? If you're not born again, you do not see the kingdom of God. That's an internal change that the Bible says comes when you call on the name of the Lord to save you. It happens by faith in his grace. And for the first incredible time, you become that new creature in Christ. You experience grace, God's incredible grace. You experience that mercy of God when you confess, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In everything that Jesus Christ is communing, communicating here on the Sermon on the Mount, he's pointing it back to your own righteousness will not save you. And unless your righteousness was even more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees, which were the religious mucky mucks of the day, they were the, the great people to look to, but... You had to exceed that. And in Jesus Christ preaching through this message of the Sermon on the Mount, which is a unique delivery. You say, well, there's bits and pieces of the verses that come out at another time. Yes, they do, but not complete like this Sermon on the Mount. And you see him delivering the truth of, pointing nation of Israel, pointing the reader to the righteousness of Christ. Again, you and I sometimes forget that throughout the word of God, our Bible is written for us to point us to the king of kings. It is about kings and kingdoms and man's rule as God empowers them to do so, but that they're always supposed to point their way back to the king and that God is supposed to be the one king, the one ruler, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so when I say it's my message, but it's his sermon, Jesus Christ in his sermon on the mount is bringing something really strong here. These are the words of Christ in his first public statement. And he's laying down the foundation for every bit of his public ministry. And you and I look at this and go, hey, God's just showing us through his son Jesus, how to just be a good person, the Christian ethics. And yeah, that's okay. But he's really, again, exposing the error of religiousness without Jesus Christ converting you. Religion without Jesus Christ is absolutely chains for a godless hell for all of eternity. Jesus Christ is the starting point. Jesus Christ is the one who's saying, Pharisaicism, religion without me, that is not going to get you. I need to awaken you, legalistic Israel, 
to the idea that you've been going on the letter of the law, thinking about how the law should be fulfilled by the letter of the law instead of understanding the spirit of grace. So here's just my first thought in looking at this. Thinking again, Jesus Christ in Matthew's gospel is looked at as the king, but also too as a lion. He's looked at as servant and portrayed as servant in gospel of Mark, but also as the ox. He's ox-like. He's a servant who takes up the servant's role. In Luke, he is shown as the son. And as he is the son of God and the son of man, he's also shown that he is the son of man in Luke. And he is looked at as this man-like God, which shows us again his incredible sovereignty and deity. And then, of course, in John's gospel, he is shown to be God completely. And, of course, eagle-like in his regality. He's the teacher, he's the preacher, he's the historian, he's the theologian in all these gospels. The teacher, he is the teacher in Matthew's gospel. And we see as he is expanding the Jews' thinking and transitioning from Old Testament to New Testament. From the letter of the law to the spirit of grace that you must understand, Jew. And you and I must, must understand religious person. Hey, religious person, you can do all the good things in the whole wide world and say that you want to be in the kingdom of heaven one day just like the Jews here that is in an Old Testament setting. And you go, but I feel like I'm missing something. That was my life for years and years and years as a little boy all the way to the time when I was 24 and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. This is without question applicable to us and as God is using this Matthew gospel to transition from the letter of the law to the spirit of grace you and I understand that there's a lot to cover let me show you just really a quick thing look at verse number 13 of chapter 5 talking about the salt of the earth you've heard that a little bit chapter it's chapter number 5 verse number 14 you're the light of the world you go down a little bit further and you see in chapter number 5 about how that we are to look at caring for others and dealing with others, but also, too, with other people's sin and how severe it is. Verse 27, talking about thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus Christ is teaching so much that is so real and powerful. In today's world, we need to understand this. But again, it's not just do all these good things and you're going to be fine. This is life in his kingdom. Believers, we're to live in his kingdom because the transformative gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, when you receive that, you're now changed and now you're in the kingdom of God. And now I am to live according to his kingdom, not be trying to find some other kingdom like my own. It says in verse number 38 of chapter 5, you've heard that I said eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and talking about how in the world that we're supposed to deal with our enemies and forgive things that are wrong and all that and you go right to the end of chapter number five and you say wow hey that's all this golden rule stuff I guess I just continue just need to do that again separate from his grace and mercy separate from a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ this is futile and that's what Jesus is pointing out for us Jesus Christ is showing us even as you go through chapter number six and you see all of that you go this is Jesus' teaching. This is the way he's coming about it. And he's showing us that it's the kingdom of heaven, yes, but from the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 24. You see, you cannot serve two masters. And of course, again, that whole, that we're going to look at all these things. We're going to look even go back before that. Verse number 19 of chapter number 6. Lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth. Goes down to verse number 21 for where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. Instead of just picking each and piece out of them, we're going to look at this entire Sermon on the Mount collectively and say, what do you want from me, Lord? Well, I'm after, he's after your heart. He's after my heart. It's not my message, it's his sermon. You look at verse number 33. Again, we're going to look at that here in a few minutes just to pull some key words out of this. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought, verse 34, for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought 
for the things of itself. Hey, why are you and I just, oh, I wonder how tomorrow's going to go. I wonder. He's saying, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That's a great, like, thanks God for that deal. Thanks, Jesus. I guess there's a bunch of stuff coming. Well, he's saying, look, the kingdom of heaven. John the Baptist said, Jesus is coming. Hey, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If they repented and if they fell and if they believed that he wasn't just, hey, he's Rabboni, he's a great teacher, wonderful, good job, master. If they received him as the king, as the high priest, as the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament, then everything would have been fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven would be established and the kingdom of God and his reign over all of his people. See, that's the way God lines it up. This is the way God lays things down. What is his sermon for us? He's saying, your life, my life, is to be lived in his kingdom. And he moves it from the teaching of those old-time prophets to the teaching of himself. And that's what's going on here. Again, this transitional gospel is so very, very important. If you pulled it out of there and picked up Mark's gospel, there'd be a lot of people going, what are you, what are you talking about here? It's a very, very important passage in this Sermon on the Mount. Again, is Jesus' first teaching in a group setting. So go back to chapter number 5, verse number 1. Think of the setting. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Who are these multitudes? Who are these disciples? You go back in chapter number 4, you see the calling of disciples, some of the disciples through Jesus Christ as he's in Galilee. You see, though, the multitudes in verse number 25 of chapter 4. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. There were people following him. They had heard prophets teaching. They had called him prophet. They said that he's a great teacher. How do you know that? Well, look at the last two verses of chapter number 7 that we'll get to in a few weeks as we finish out our study. Look at chapter number 7, the last two verses. Now this is kind of funny. You say, what do you mean? I'll show you in a minute. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Now hang on a minute. This is the God of glory. This is the Son of God and the Son of Man. He is the King of kings. He is God. And yet, they're astonished at him. Now, just a quick question. How many of you have ever taught the Bible to someone? Would you raise your hand real quick? Thank you. Thank you. So all of you, you're in good company when people said to you, I'm shocked that you could teach me anything from the Bible. <laughs> because they were astonished at Jesus Christ, too. You're in good company. They were astonished at his doctrine and his teaching. Why? The next verse will tell you why. Because it says there, in verse number 29, For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes, as the prophets that had come. How Zechariah and Zephaniah had come before. How the prophet Moses had come before how all those that before Jesus had taught the teaching of the prophets, it was great. But the teaching of Jesus Christ was different. And they were astonished because he taught as one with authority. Guess what? People are astonished when you teach his sermon, his notes, his way. You see, that's the power of the Holy Spirit of God in you, through you, working upon you through this powerful, beautiful word, the living word of God. The teachings of the prophets were great, 
but the teachings of Jesus Christ were even greater. And this Sermon on the Mount shows us so very, very much so that when Jesus said some of the things he said to them, like in chapter number 7, real quick, in verse number 1, judge not that ye be not judged. We hear that all the time. Well, we're going to break into that scripturally and see what Jesus really taught there. It says there about hypocrisy. It talks about verse number 7, asking it shall be given, teaching us how to pray, how to ask the Lord. It then lays down in verse number 13 about what it will be like to see people come to Christ and people that don't come to Christ. And on and on he goes and he gets to verse 15 he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You see, there are some false prophets that teach false doctrine. And Jesus Christ, again, in this setting, think about it again. We were at David's kingdom, and now we're moving into, okay, this is God's kingdom. Well, yeah, I thought it was all God's, yes. But as we study through that, we realize that in you knowing and understanding the Bible in a bigger picture... You can't just negate certain passages because you don't know them. You can't just negate, ah, well, that's dispensationally doesn't talk to me. Hang on a minute here. Then that means we need to throw all out all the books of the Bible that don't really talk to the church. That's not what God wants you and I to do. He wants us to learn from each one of them. He wants us to understand that he has teaching for all of us. So, Matthew 6, 33. All I want to do is share with you just a couple of just, just personal things that lay down here. Because Jesus' sermon, Jesus' message, Jesus' way of getting things across to these Jews moves itself into speaking to us about how we are to live truly in his kingdom. And how we're to treat other people. Relationships with God. That's what we need to look at. A relationship with all of our stuff that we have or don't have. And relationships with other people. We could use a little bit of refresher course. Because again, Jesus' sermon, Jesus' sermon about his kingdom, it's centered on the primary and the spiritual kingdom, which is his. What does that verse say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You say, I've heard that verse before. I know I'm supposed to just... You know what the meaning of the word seek is? There in the context? Hunger. A desperate hunger. As though you hadn't eaten a meal for the kingdom of God. Do we have a desperate hunger for the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It says in Romans 14. The joy of peace. When you and I look at how the Lord God and his lining up of things for you and me in the church goes back to him being the king, us being in his kingdom, and us understanding that the kingdom of heaven is that physical kingdom and the complete fulfillment and being established for that thousand year millennial reign. That we, as born-again believers, in his grace and in his mercy, and doctrinally are set in his kingdom, the kingdom of God, he says, I want you to be centered on, because my sermon's centered on, the first kingdom, the primary kingdom, and the spiritual kingdom. The spirit of God inside of you and me. It reminds us. That we are not just to live in this literal world, in this carnal world, in this fleshly world, in this physical world. And that's all our life is about. In fact, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God in merging with the kingdoms of this world, when God flattens this thing and brings it all back to the way he wants it to be, will all merge one day. And we're supposed to be getting ready for that. Are you getting ready for that? Are you and I living in God's kingdom? Or are we seeing our own kingdom? I've used this illustration before. That little K, that's in front of my little kingdom. I like my little kingdom. I like everything to be for me and with me. and, and it, I, I like when everything goes my way. I like my little house and I like my little car and I like my little world. 
And God's saying, look, you're supposed to seek the kingdom of God. That's the spiritual part of us that we are born again into. And in my kingdom, in the way that I operate, it's got a capital K in front of it. And that's for the king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's where our man, King David, slipped up quite a bit. That's where I slip up. So we know that there's doctrinal importance here. And then there's practical importance here. And be careful, be careful that we don't fall as a hypocrite living in this religious kingdom that I think about as being just for me. A second simple practical thought that his sermon and the way that he is delivering his sermon, my message, his sermon, is filled with the true and holy righteousness. His. A lot of people have their own self-righteousness. In fact, uh, the more years that I have been saved and, and been in church culture and been around, I look at myself deeply seeing that I can fall into my own righteousness. Things that I learned from God's word two years ago, three years ago, I've developed this little religion way and, and so it fits perfectly in my little narrative that my righteousness, well, excuse me now, let, let's just be straight up here, a little bit of God's righteousness, yeah, a little bit of watching others that have good righteousness and having some of their righteousness and then, and then maybe, and maybe a, a servant's righteousness because of course I'm supposed to serve and then, you know, sharing the gospel and, 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 and all of a sudden I, I find myself looking at my own message and not his sermon that says I'm to be filled with the true and holy righteousness of Jesus Christ. His righteousness. But again, we're funny that way. We somehow, some way have put ourselves in a position where that saving righteousness that was imputed upon you, by the way, the unrighteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that was imputed on you from Romans chapter number 3. You know that righteousness where it says in Romans chapter 3, I believe around verse 21, 22, 23, it says in verse number 26, to declare I say at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That is the verse that's tied together with verse 25 that says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. That's the righteousness that Jesus Christ is presenting to the Pharisees, the religious people of the day, and saying, hey, guess what? All that you're doing there is just to convict you and convince you that your own righteousness and your own kingdom is not going to save your soul. And it's going to send you straight to a godless hell. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. But it's amazing to me, after we get saved, we forget about how his righteousness is the one that I'm supposed to seek. Because it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, comma, and his righteousness. I'm supposed to seek both of them. I'm supposed to go after them. Righteousness and being righteous, or, or the word righteous is mentioned over 300 times in your Bible. So, his sermon, his sermon which is a powerful, powerful word here for us, is centered on the primary kingdom. It is filled with his true and holy righteousness because it's his. And the last part of that verse, here you go. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So let me go back on that slide. Here you go. His sermon is empowered with promise and security added unto you. What's added unto you? His stuff is added unto you. That's what it says. He, being empowered, it says, at the end of chapter 7, says, I will add my stuff to you. That's what it says. 
Don't say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 wait a minute. All these things shall be added unto you. So he's adding his No, 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 no. If you go to the context back in chapter number six, you realize what it's all about. It's about being clothed with the grass of field. Why are you concerned, O ye of little faith? What are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? God says, why are you and I so worried about the stuff? When he says, by his empowerment, by the way he sees it, I promise, and you can lay hold in the security of my promise, that I will add unto you. Well, he hasn't added the things that I want. That's my issue. My issue. But I asked him for this, 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 and this, and he told me to do that. That's in that, that's in that same Sermon on the Mount. We'll have to cover that. Because ask, and you'll get it. That's kind of the way that we rewrite the Bible, right? That's what it says. Ask, and you'll get it. Right? right? No, no. You see, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. They are his things that he'll add to you. You need a morsel of bread? He'll give it to you. But he'll add it to you as he says he'll add it to you. You don't know what you need sometimes, and he says, I know what to give you. I'll add to you things that you never, ever were paying attention to. I'll add to you mercy when you had no mercy. I'll add grace to your life when you had no grace. I'll add kindness to you. I'll add goodness to you. I'll add the spirit of God's power in your life in a greater way. I'll add the ability to memorize scripture to you. I will add your food, your clothing, yes, my stuff and all my stuff, but I'll add things to you that you just didn't even pay attention to. And that's what he's saying when by his sermon, which is empowered with promise and security, adds his stuff, not my stuff. Because my stuff gets me in an awful lot of trouble. How does this tie together as we come to close in a time of prayer? When it's his sermon, we must respond with decisive actions. What kind of actions? Decisive actions. Well, I'll get to it. I know in the last couple of months we haven't had a time of prayer at the end of our messages, but we will today. I think we'll be just fine. If you want to pray in your seat and your time, that's okay. But I believe it's time for us to really be confronted by the reality of what the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God is teaching us. Yes, I could take this passage of Scripture and say it's dispensationally for the Jews and just push it out the door. And we could do that with a lot of stuff. But God put this Matthew's gospel in here for a purpose. It's a transitional gospel that without it, you'd be in an awful lot of trouble understanding those other gospels. I promise you that. And we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount and see what God has because I need to check myself in this day that I live. And you all, all of us need to. Where is my life at? Is your life lived according to his kingdom? Or is it lived according to your kingdom? Why don't you bow your heads for a word of prayer? Our first service people had a wonderful transition and will do the same as we went into, of course, a, a time of baptism. But we're just going to 